How do you measure success? Is it measured by wealth, by fame, or something else? Success is an enchanting word. It's that magical stardust that we all want to be touched by. And for some, it can be a motivator, a reason to wake up in the morning. But success doesn't come easy, especially for a thoroughbred racehorse. 20,000 thoroughbreds are born each year. About 60% of those horses go into training and run in a race. And of those, only about 5%. 600 horses win a race. Successful athletes, both equine and human, are not superheroes. Instead, they possess the ability to maximize their skills into consistently positive results. They believe in themselves. They are blessed to be surrounded by coaches and trainers who give them the care and attention they need to be successful. This is the story of an equine athlete who along with the dedicated work and care of those around him, became a champion, the people's horse. This is the story of Whitmore. finds a seam and bursts through! And Whitmore's on the move. Whitmore, a budding sprint superstar, is Whitmore to crush Whitmore! Whitmore's racing career spans seven years, earning over four and a half million dollars and multiple graded stakes victories. But our story doesn't start in the bluegrass country of Kentucky. It starts on the border of Arkansas and Oklahoma. Well, I'm from the border of Arkansas and Oklahoma. I went to school at Pocola, Oklahoma, and a lot of the, uh, all the match races I went to were in Oklahoma. But uh, I tell everybody I'm from the, from the border. For Ron Moquette, his passion for animals and sports led him down the path of becoming a teacher of horses. I like the connection with the animals. I uh, really enjoy being around animals of all kind, but, but uh, Horses have always been so noble and such a useful, you know, useful thing in my life and I just wanted to spend as much time as I could and I thought maybe being a, a coach to, uh, to horses was pretty cool. I always say that we, our careers are on the backs of horses, they carry us wherever we go and uh, Whitmore knocked down a lot of barriers for us. Success doesn't come without hard work and a strong team and Whitmore needed a lot of special attention during his formative years of training. He got that from Ron's wife, Laura, and assistant trainer, Greta Kunzweiler. Ron bought him after the sale and shipped him up to us at Churchill, and he was at Saratoga at the time. And I'll never forget the first day he went to the track that Greta and I were up in the trainer stand watching the boys gallop a set of babies in company. Well, another one of our riders, Giovanni, was on him, and I was going in company, we're trying to get him to go forward you know train like a normal horse right and he was like uh, throwing himself down going this way going that way and Giovanni and he's like a good rider like he has no problem with horses but his helmet slipped down because of how you know forceful he was he wheeled he slid to a stop he froze up he acted like he's gonna flip he's bucking and kicking and we were like oh my god what did Ron send us and while Whitmore was still learning the finer points of being a racehorse his racing name was still being decided. We ended up finding out that he was named after a, the lady that ran the farm where he was born and, and she obviously was very pleasant and her name was Mel, Melody. And uh, you know, so I, I think it's a cool name, it just didn't suit this, this horse because the statement was, is, you know, he doesn't look like a male and he's not very pleasant. And, uh, he was a natural gifted athlete who could do things, if he set his mind to it, he could do things that others couldn't. And, and uh, that put me in a reminding of, of someone else. Wilbur Whitmore. Ah yes, what a powerful name. Wilbur Whitmore, Ron's childhood friend. The pair met in the seventh grade while attending Pecola High School and were teammates on the school's basketball squad. That's all he cared. He said, 
You're too short to be this bad and not hustle, son. <laughs> <laughs> he found a way to get us all motivated. That's right. Yeah, Ron said he was just the freakiest athlete he'd been around, and he's like, now we got another one. I'm naming him after Wilbur. Comparisons athletically was right on. Just as gifted an athlete as you've seen and, and did everything that everybody else wanted to do, and it was hard, it was easy for him. And I, for whatever reason, his name is the one that come to mind whenever it happened, and, uh, and I called him and, and got permission. He told me, he said, when I got a horse, and boy, he reminds me a lot of you. Ronald said he was just a good looking horse. I grew up in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Uh, I guess from uh, kindergarten through sixth grade and seventh grade, we moved to Pecola. And that's where I met Ron. We were in seventh grade, we were just starting junior high. Yeah, and uh, like I said, we played, uh, Ron was a year older than us, so, but being Pecola being a, such a small town, everybody seen everybody, so we all merged together and been friends ever since. I think I played down in the post, and Ronald was the point guard, so he was the one issuing the ball. He was pretty good at shooting that long ball. Yeah, he really wasn't a real big guy, but that he had good handles, can handle the ball good, and he shot very well. Boy, he hated to lose. <laughs> he was real competitive, and, uh, and he worked hard at everything that he got involved in. Here comes Whitmore. Whitmore and even with all right of Whitmore's antics, the Moquette Barn was still Andre able to get him to the races as a two-year-old. His journey began at Churchill Downs on a sunny Friday afternoon in early November. And Whitmore, Whitmore finishing full of runs, sails home to win it by five. Everything he did as a baby, or even up until his last race, everything he did usually was super simple for him. And the fact that you're leading a baby up there that's not 100% ready, you know, he's like 80%, that he could just make fun of the field like that, we thought, uh-oh, <laughs> this really might be something good. Trainers know everything while knowing nothing for sure, right? And we thought that he had a lot of ability, but until you see him do it, you, you're not really for sure. And uh, I saw in him in the afternoon what he'd been showing he was capable of in the morning. And, uh, you know, as is the norm, uh, as soon as I got out of the winter circle, there was a bunch of calls, and it was, some of them was congratulations, but most of them were, is he for sale? We had been to the Kentucky Derby with with uh, Mr. Rosenblum and Mr. Lapenta, so the Southern Springs group got together and decided to sell a piece of Whitmore to to uh, Mr. Rosenblum and Lapenta, and uh, we made it to the Kentucky Derby together. But the road to the Kentucky Derby is never an easy one. Whitmore second. Training Whitmore to run longer distances in Derby prep races was likely one of Ron's greatest training achievements. Whitmore was second. And Whitmore, as usual, kept answering the bell, earning a spot in the starting gate for the 142nd Run for the Roses. The best job we did training him was to try to, to get him to where he made the Kentucky Derby. They're off in the Kentucky Derby. Obviously, you know, you don't see a lot of horses that are sprint champions running that well long. And, you know, he <clears throat> is built like a drag car. Whitmore is after that, in between. He's not necessarily built like the long, scopey body style of a horse that you would think was going to go a mile and a quarter. Victor Espinosa is down on the rail with Whitmore. They're four and a half. Served to be there. He uh, injured himself in that race, or I thought we'd have probably had a much better showing. After an injury in the Kentucky Derby, Ron gave Whitmore over six months to recover and ease him back into training. Whitmore would tell Ron when he was ready to run again. So when we come back from that, we give him the amount of time that we thought he needed to get over it. And we come back, I start my horses. I don't care if you're gonna run a mile and a half. I start you short. Here comes Whitmore who strikes to lead with a furlong to go. And because I would rather you get fit, finishing well and happy at a shorter distance, and then that tells me for sure you're ready to do more. But Whitmore returns to the races a winner. So I called my, my wife, Laura, and after the race and said, well, he wasn't quite as fit as I'd hoped, but 
how did he cool out, you know, or how is he cooling out? He's on his way. She said, Ron, he's not even breathing hard. No, Whitmore wasn't breathing hard at all. And he found his true calling as a racehorse sprinting. Whitmore, Whitmore just there to win it by a neck. It was, it was fun to stack him up. You start thinking he's wearing a cape, like he got Superman in the stall. <laughs> From that point on, I stopped looking at route races. I was just, you know, he showed us what he wants to do and what's easier on him. So our job as horsemen and, is, and trainers is, uh, is to make his life, you know, as easy and happy as possible and he'll, he'll help us. The sprinting came naturally to him for sure. He loves that just one big kick at the end. While Whitmore was achieving tremendous success as a sprinter, he was still in search of capturing his first grade one victory. And what better place to do that? than historic Saratoga race course. Whitmore and Ricardo Santana Jr. to do it over City of Light. It's a horse that he never gave up. He always tried hard. Every time you ask him, and the more you ask him, the more he tried. It was the Forgo. It was named after a horse that kind of reminded me of Whitmore. And, uh, you know, and it showed at that point, everyone said he was an Oakland horse. You know, he got lucky at Keeneland, and he had got lucky at Pimlico, but He's primarily because he's had so much success at Oaklawn, he's just an Oaklawn horse. He's better at Oaklawn than he is other places. And, and that kind of shut him up. It was like, I don't want to hear you say that anymore. As in any sport, there are rivalries and horse racing is no different. For Ron and Whitmore, it was Ron's good friend, Hall of Fame trainer, Steve Asmussen. I always joke around, Asmussen is my friend and got a lot of respect for him. He does a wonderful job, obviously, but he kept on bringing these horses, and kept on bringing them, and no matter what, every one of these races I was in, there was always an Asmussen horse that was, that was a runner. I mean, Asmussen wins a lot of really good races. Whitmore, what, you know, what a great, great horse for, you know, Ron and Laura and uh, Greta, the whole team over there, you know, just how they adored him and stuff. We uh, obviously had the, pleasure of competing with him on the highest level. Entered the villain of, of Matoli and Asmussen. Matoli and Whitmore to the final 16th and Matoli has now turned away Whitmore. Whitmore is back to second. Matoli wins big. Because he was the first horse to beat us at six furlongs at Oaklawn. I think he's the epitome of, the ra of a race horse that makes you love the sport so much. We got beat by the eventual Eclipse champion and Breeders' Cup winner. And that was just two things I keep going over in my mind is, is that showed just how contentious the sprint division was at Oakland year in and year out. That every year somebody's placing the Breeders' Cup sprint. But every year, the for like three or four years, the races that were the marquee races were won by horses that went through Oakland. And that year it was my Tolly. Tolly wins the sprint. Oh, what a horse he is. Shots off a second, then Whitmore. And... Whitmore was truly a horse of the people. And while he might have been Arkansas's horse, his fan base stretched well beyond the borders of the natural state. Their level of fandom rivaled the tenacity of Whitmore himself. And trainer Ron Moquette would have it no other way. If, if it was at a, a fevered pitch, before with people following him and that race solidified whenever Whitmore become, you know, like the mystique of Whitmore actually grew to be uh, something that I was like, you know, now your job is just to manage this. We started, we would put a picture of Whitmore up and then everybody would start telling the story. And I was like, man, I don't want anything to happen to this. So we started the website. Yeah, and I think his you know, career being so long helped that. Also him you know, being so cantankerous and kicking at the gate crew and doing all the things that he did just to, I, I swear it's just so he'd get more likes on Facebook, I don't know. Horses are such majestic creatures and little girls especially seem to love these amazing animals. Almost every young girl at some point in their childhood asked their parents for a pony. Seven-year-old Finley Barnett was no different. Well, wait a minute, maybe a little different. So one day um, with my Mimi and Papi, um, 
we were just um, watching some of them um, just running around practicing, and then Rama Oket comes up and says, are you a Whitmore fan? And we were like, mm-hmm. And he said, do you want to come meet Whitmore in his barn? And I said, yes. Finley loves to draw, and Whitmore has often been the subject of her portraits. And as with any artist, being able to meet the object of your work can have a memorable impact. And I remember when he was biting my um, Mimi and Puppets jackets. Last night we were watching um, a video um, of him. Um, they're on an interview, um, like um, talking about how crazy and stuff he is, and how um, Rama Cat saw him and bought him. He was really little. I remember her. I, I still have a picture of her. So I'm. Uh, I. I'm. She's one of the people that that always uh, reminds me of, of just, you know, how cool, it, how cool this connection with this horse was. I went with his biggest fan. Yes, we still have her card that she made him in, in our office. She drew a picture of him, and I think it was before the race. It was, you know, a, a good luck card. It was really sweet. Sometimes the way you can prove how great you are is to lose. But losing can be a heartbreaking experience especially for a seven-year-old. She threw herself down on the apron and had a good cry. That's what I heard. Yeah, yeah. Which, I, I, I did that inside, Finley. <laughs> Oops, I touched my microphone. But I did the same. Whenever you think about the connection that this and the, and the impression that this horse has made with, with people, you think about Finley. It was really special just to see young people that are interested in the sport because the only thing they see really is what's on line or on TV, the Triple Crown or the Breeders' Cup. And that's kind of what got me started, wanting to follow this path in life. And it, you never know what spurs someone to move forward on this as a career. And she sounds like she might be collectively uh, going with us for the rest of her life. I want to work at um, Oakland when I grow up and um, like, um, train the horses and give them baths and stuff. 2020 was a year like no other for the world, our country, and sports. Horse racing was not immune to COVID. No one was. But racing still went on, and so did Whitmore. There was people on the outside, and, you know, I, I walked in to watch the race by myself, but, uh, and then whenever I went back out, side there was people in my front yard you know honking and waving and screaming so it was it was pretty cool inside and manny wah he's gonna do it again look at this race horse flagstaff just ran into second it is whitmore the breeders cup sprint had eluded whitmore three previous attempts yielded a second and third place finish Ron was confident, and so was Whitmore. Would the fourth time be the charm? It was a weird thing. I, I can't really explain it other than saying that I knew we were gonna win the race. Anybody that knows me knows that even if I think I'm gonna win something, I usually don't say it. I'll say, oh, if we get a good trip, or if everything works out right, you know? You always gotta leave, a, leave an escape hatch in case horse racing jumps in and and takes over. So I decided that I was going to try to see how many Breeders' Cup Sprint horses I could I could write down on memory. And uh, I was able to write almost all of them down on memory, including the year. And right before we walked over to go run in the Breeders' Cup, I had 2020 empty. I wrote down 2019, 2018, Roy H. And, you know, I had all these names written down from, from Card Mania all the way to Gulch and said my little safety prayer that I, you know, I don't ask to win, but I just ask that they come back safe. And then I wrote down Whitmore before we ran. And that was cool. Whitmore has taken the lead. CZ Rocket on the outside, up into second lane, but the old man's gonna do it. It's Whitmore in the Breeders' Cup Sprint. He won it by about five. You know, he brought a game and when it, it's, like when he was passing probably 316th pole and he got that opening, I started losing my absolute mind. I think I 
hugged a random stranger, at least one random stranger <laughs> screaming and then ran to the winner's circle. <laughs> it was cool. Victory in the 2020 Breeders' Cup Sprint meant national validation, an Eclipse Award. Whitmore was crowned champion male sprinter. But Whitmore had long been a champion to Ron, to Laura, to Greta, and all of his fans around the country. But I think this was verification. And this was, you know, before it was a lot of people's opinion, and now it was a fact. He was a champion. And, you know, I don't really like popularity contests, and, but it was sure fun to win one. To finally get it was amazing, and, and then the Eclipse Award was just like, I mean, just being on both sides, like as a, as a jockey and now as an assistant, um, you know, it's such an honor to get an Eclipse. Whitmore left a lasting impression on everyone who saw him. He gave us seven years of consistent performances and all the ups and downs that come with racing. He took his races from track to track, always showing up and giving it his all. And most importantly, he was loved by so many. Nobody, no, I've never been around another horse like him, no. And I kept thinking after, you know, his first couple of years, um, every young horse that would come up, I'd be like, oh, this is going to be the next Whitmore, you know, but then, you know, once they run, it's like, oh, no, we're not going to have another Whitmore, you know, we were so lucky, so lucky to be around him. He started when he was a two-year-old and he went through the derby grind and all that, you know, I was, uh, you know, he's, he's an old throwback horse, just an iron horse, you could, you could try that with, you know, a lot of very well meant horses and not get half that far. Seeing the gate open, he, he, he let you do whatever you want and top it to him. He was really special. Um, you know, I have a lot of great memory with him and I'm really blessed to ride a horse. He was the, uh, like the non-fictional, um, you know, Rocky Balboa kind of, you know, everybody following him, they all cheered and and it made it that much more special. Being there, uh, what made me re really feel good is that a guy that I grew up with had hands on with him to make him become the, 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 uh, the horse that he was. And Laura Moquet might have had the closest relationship to Whitmore. She saw him at his best and worst, both in the morning and in the afternoon. Oh, everything. I'm gonna be crying. <laughs> I don't know, it's just um, knowing all the challenges that he's been through and always bringing his A-game and being on the road with him, it's just been the most amazing thing in my life. But to have him still be in their presence, you know, usually a horse retires and they disappear and you never see him again. So having him here gets everybody, <laughs> sorry, you're gonna have to cut this. <laughs> Um, it just keeps everybody excited in the game. And like so many athletes before him, Major League Baseball legend Cal Ripken Jr.'s jog around Camden Yards, NASCAR's Hall of Famers Tony Stewart and Jeff Gordon's final lap at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Whitmore had his moment at the place he called home. At this time, we call your attention to the Clubhouse Hotel Turn, where you will see Whitmore, one of the most popular horses to ever run here at Oakland. On Whitmore's behalf, we're honored. Ladies and gentlemen, an Oakland legend, the one, the only, Whitmore. Ah, yes, Whitmore Day at Oaklawn. Over 37,000 fans turned out to pay tribute to this horse of the people. And the Hot Springs Stakes, a race that Whitmore won four times, was renamed the Whitmore Stakes and run that day in his honor. Here's Bob's Edge trying to go last to first and look at him blow by! Bob's Edge, two-lane tryst, Bob's Edge, wow! We're just, the, we're the human connections behind him. Uh, we've had a lot of horses run at Oakland and none of them have a stake race, their stake race named after them. So it's to, for them to show their, their, you know, affection and appreciation for this horse is, uh, is really, really cool and we appreciate it a lot. I think that's one of the things that endeared him to fans 
You know, it's the sport of kings, but the majority of us that's in the grandstand on any given Saturday when Whitmore's running are, are you know, working type people. And uh, the way that we get most anything that we have is, is by outperforming or wanting it more than the guy or gal next to us. And I think Whitmore embodied that and he had a connection with those type people. They loved to see honest effort and that's what he was. He wasn't the most talented, though he was talented. And, you know, he wasn't the best, best bred or any of that. He was just someone that said, I want it more than you. When you think of Whitmore, what comes to mind? Was it the fact that he raced so long at the highest level? Was it his grit, his tenacity, that determination? Was it his reliability and honesty as a racehorse? Was it his name? Maybe all these things and more, so much more. He reminded us all of what is so good about this sport and what it can be again. Whitmore was truly a once-in-a-lifetime horse for Ron Moquette and his barn. There may never be another Whitmore, but in a true spirit of horse racing, we can all hope.